So the next speaker is Professor Jean-Michel Bismuth from Paris. Please. Okay, great. So <laughs> I'm very happy that the microphone is working and also to be at Vitaly's birthday conference. I must say that when I try to think about Vitaly and ask myself, when did I meet Vitaly? I cannot remember. I mean, it's like having met him and been with him all, his li all our life. And uh, I learned many things from him on every aspect of life. It could be, it could be. <laughs> but also about, I mean, he taught me many things. Actually, uh, when I speak with him, it's difficult for me to say something. But uh, he taught me many things about mathematics, about how to run a journal. I recognize his influence, fundamental influence in the running of GAFA in particular. And uh, I've authorized myself uh, from the acronyms of GAFA, geometric and functional analysis to use the part Ah, end of GAFA to say that I will not speak about asymptotic analysis, more about geometry and analysis. And I will explain uh, this uh, hypolytic drug operator, the trace formula. So what is it about? It's about the description of an interpolation between two sort of classical objects. <laughs> one is a Laplacian, as you know it, and the other one is the basic flow. So the first one is an operator, the other one is a vector field. And it turns out that there is a possible interpolation between these two kinds of gadgets. This interpolation, in some sense, is non-standard, and it has remarkable properties, in particular <laughs> the fact that certain fundamental invariants, like the original spectrum of the Laplacian are preserved under the deformation. So I will proceed by stage, moving from elementary examples to more complicated ones. So uh, I just, first of all, will consider a Schrodinger operator. So I give myself x to be a compact dependent manifold of volume 1. And I give myself two smooth functions, the first one being of integral 0. And I consider the following Schrodinger kind of operator. So it's a combination of the Laplacian and these two functions with different scalings. And I obtain an operator SB, which is a self absorbed operator, elliptic. And I call sigma B to be its lowest eigenvalue. value. And my first concern, that's a very elementary problem in some sense, is to study the behavior of this sigma B as B tends to zero. So, as you see, when b tends to 0, the Laplacian gets bigger and bigger, except where the Laplacian vanishes, except on the zero eigenvalue, on the constants. And then it is a function v over b, which takes over. So that's why there is an interesting problem there. So I will explain what happens to the spectrum of this operator, sb, as b tends to 0. So to explain this, first of all, I introduce the heat kernel the PBS of xx prime, the smooth kernel for this operator. And I will state a simple uh, result. <laughs> yes. So it's a combination of the Laplacian with a coefficient 1 over b squared out of a function with a coefficient 1 over b. Is this one constant or something? Sorry? Uh, I mean, uh, that you can think of it as a Planck. I mean, actually, in the end, it will be a mass. You will have to think of the parameter b as a mass of a particle. Okay, that will be the interpretation in the end. So making b tend to zero means that the mass tends to zero. 
why is this B vanishes? What's the point of being integral zero? What is this B that leaves it over there? Sorry? Why is this integral V is zero? Uh, because if it were not zero, you would not have a natural, I mean, that's, you know, uh, you would not have a limit of this operator as b tends to zero. I mean, if you just replace v by a constant, just add to v a constant, then you have one over b. You have this constant over b, and this determines the behavior of the spectrum. Okay, so you have net necessarily to take, to consider the constants as being out of the game. Okay, so, <laughs> the result is that the heat kernel for this operator converges to a constant. And I wrote this constant here, which is just the exponential of essentially what you have is a quadratic expression in the potential. The uh, V paired with itself via the inverse, via the resolvent of the Laplacian, evaluated on the orthogonal constant functions. And the consequence of this result is that the lowest eigenvalue of our operator <laughs> converges to uh, the sum of two terms. The second term is trivial, that the integral over W over x. But the first term is much more interesting. <laughs> That's minus v again, paired with v <laughs> via the inverse of the Laplacian. OK. so. The interpretation of this result, there is an interesting interpretation of this result from a probabilistic point of view. It is related to the central limit theorem for Brownian motion on the manifold. And this inverse of the Laplacian is related to what's called the free field on the manifold X. So this is, in some sense, the version dimension one of the results I will explain later on. So, what I do now is just take the case of a vector bundle. That is, instead of looking at operators acting on functions, I will make act them act on a vector bundle. So I give myself f to be a vector bundle with metric and connection. And I give myself also a gen yes? It's three connections, yes, as the notation indicates. I give myself a generalized Laplace A acting on the smooth sections of this uh, vector bundle f. So, Bob the light Laplace, yes, but you could perturb it or whatever. And then you call p the orthogonal projection on the kernel of a. So, I give myself two endomorphisms of the vector bundle, and I assume that, in some sense, V maps the kernel of A into its orthogonal. We will explain this assumption later on. In the case I had before, the assumption that the integral of V was equal to zero exactly means that multiplication by V maps the kernel of the Laplacian the constant in the orthogonal. And I give myself again an operator which have exactly the same structure, A over B squared plus V over B plus W. And the question is again, what is the behavior of the spectrum of this operator as b tends to zero? So I call PBS, x and x prime, the heat kernel, for this operator. And the result is I will immediately give the second line, just don't look at the first one, that as b tends to zero, now, as b tend to zero, most eigenvalues tend to infinity for our operators, except a finite number of them. And this finite number of them is determined by the eigenvalues of the matrix which acts on the kernel of A. So you have your elliptic operator, your generalized Laplacian. You look at its kernel, which is finite dimensional. And on this kernel, you look at the following matrix, minus p, v, a minus 1, v, p, plus p, w, v, p. That's a matrix acting on the curve. But it's typically this kernel on the field or the field? Uh, the on the field, huh? No, no, the kernel, in the case of the Laplace, the kernel was constant functions. No, no, but when you have the connection, usually it's zero. No, zero okay, I, I will give you later on an example, obvious example, geometric example in which the kernel is non-trivial. 
that absolutely says something is not true. It is true, yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so in this case, you would not have no contribution here. All the eigenvalues will go to infinity. I mean, that, that would be fairly obvious. You have the Laplacian divide by B squared, and much bigger. OK, so in other words, the eigenvalues in this case converge not to just one eigenvalue, but a collection of eigenvalues. But these eigenvalues themselves are determined by the eigenvalues of a matrix acting on a finite dimensional vector space. OK, so the proof of the convergence is, is quite elementary. What you do is that you write the operator SB in a sort of matrix form with respect to the splitting of the L2 space into the curl and its orthogonal. You write it as a matrix, as a two by two matrix. And then you just do a standard computation of the resolvent of a two by two matrix by uh, any matrix method. And then you find that the resolvent converges in the proper sense to the resolvent I mentioned before. So this is essentially the this is essentially the argument. You have to justify this, but that explains the appearance of these V A minus 1 V P. So we will now immediately put ourselves in a geometric context in which now this vector bundle actually F will turn out to be infinite dimensional. So I give myself again X to be a compact Riemannian manifold. And I call X script to be the total space of the tangent bundle. So in other words, I double the dimension of the manifold. I introduce these extra fibers of the tangent bundle. And then I introduce the harmonic oscillator. The harmonic oscillator on a vector space is a well-known operator. That's an elliptic operator, <coughs> self-adjoint. It just acts fiber-wise. And it's known that it has discrete spectrum. Its spectrum is the integers, and actually its kernel is one-dimensional, its kernel, and that the Gaussian function. I'll also introduce Z to be a vector field. That's the generator of the geodesic flow. So on the total space of the tangent bundle, you have a certain canonical vector field, which I wrote here in geodesic coordinates. If you take Y to be the typical element in the fiber, the geodesic flow can be written in this form. Sorry, what is capital Y? Sorry? Capital Y. Yes, Yi, D over DXR. Yes. What's the difference between capital Y and capital Z? Sorry, sorry. What is the difference between capital Y? No, no. Y is a coordinate in the fiber, and X is a coordinate in the base. OK? So D over DXI differentiated the base direction, Yi is just a vector element. N is the dimension of the manifold. And the operator now, LB, is written as a combination of H over B squared minus Z over B. So this sort of operator is known as Fokker-Planck. It is non-self-adjoint because of the presence of the vector field. And it is not elliptic. So as I mentioned before, the kernel of the harmonic oscillator is essentially generated by the Gaussian function along the fiber, just a Gaussian function. So actually, you can identify the kernel of H with the smooth functions on the base, tensored by the Gaussian function. And this, in turn, you can identify with the smooth functions on the base. So I claim that our operator has exactly formally the same structure as before. That is, that the vector field Z maps the kernel of H into its orthogonal. So why does the geodesic flow map the kernel of H into its orthogonal? Essentially because the geodesic flow is linear in the variable Y, and the kernel of H is just a Gaussian. And so if you multiply a Gaussian by a linear function, you get something which is orthogonal to the Gaussian. So actually, LB is not an elliptic operator. As I said, it's an hyperelliptic operator. This will play, actually plays a fundamental role in the analysis. It has compact resolvent and discrete, eventually non-real spectrum. So let me now call PBS the heat kernel for this new operator. And let me call PS to be the heat kernel for the operator of the base. So I have two operators, one acting on this big space and the other one 
acting on the small, on the ba original base space. Sorry, sorry? Well, I mean, it's, it's hypoelliptic, so it's a good, analytically good operator, so it still has a heat kernel. Okay, that's so the result actually, it dates back to Kolmogorov. It's, it's not self adjoint with a heat kernel. So it has a good resolvent, it has still compact resolvent. Yes, yeah, you can still take on it. Okay, so it's good, analytically good. So actually, when B tends to zero, the heat kernel over there, in some sense, collapses to, collapses to the heat kernel on the base. So as B tends to zero, if you look at the heat kernel, it collapses to the, essentially the heat kernel on the base, and there are just extra terms, Gaussian terms, along the fiber, which correspond to the projection on the kernel of the harmonic oscillator. So, also, in the same way as before, in the finite dimensional case, you can say that the spectrum of LB, of our original operator, this combination of the harmonic oscillator and the geodesic flow, the spectrum converges to the spectrum of the original Laplace in the proper sense. All the other eigenvalues tend to infinity. So it is exactly this sort of object that I will look at, put at work in the geometric context, and hoping that eventually the spectrum of LB will not only converge, but will be equal in the proper sense to the spectrum of the original Laplacian. So the proof again is exactly in some sense, I just give a formal proof here. You just call P to be the projection of the kernel of the harmonic oscillator. And you write the resolvent of the operator LB as a two by two matrix. And just adapting formally what I said in the finite dimensional context, I find that this resolvent collapses to the resolvent of a rate calculated on the base which is now calculated on the base because the kernel of the apotic oscillator are just a smooth function on the base. And if you now do this computation, P, Z, H minus 1, Z, P, Z as a geodesic flow, it differentiates once in the base. So actually, when you get twice Z, you get something that differentiates once, and you get the original Laplace. So that's in some sense the explanation of the fact that the operator LB collapses in the proper sense to the original Laplacian on the base. If you like, it's a version of a Riemannian collapsing, <coughs> but it's not Riemannian collapsing, because there is something which is fishy here, which makes that the base and the fiber interact in a non-trivial way. So let me write now an interpolation property. I wrote the operator LB again, combination of the harmonic oscillator and the geodesic flow. So, I'm saying actually that you can write the operator LB as interpolating in the proper sense between the original Laplacian on the base for B equals zero. I already gave elements for this. I already showed or told you that the spectrum of LB converges to the spectrum of this one and the heat kernel converges to this one. But I also say that when B tends to infinity, when B tends to infinity, the dominating term in this combination becomes a geodesic flow. This is just by simple rescheming of coordinates. So actually, in the interpolation, you have something which interpolates between the Laplacian on one hand for B equals zero and the geodesic flow for B equals infinity. This is the physics language. It's the description of the interpolation in the so-called Hamiltonian formalism. There is a dynamical version of the interpolation that I will not talk about, except at the end when mentioning the Langevin equation, which says that the counterpart to this interpolation is an interpolation of dynamical systems. So there is a way in physics to go pass from operators to path integrals. And the corresponding dynamics is this equation, b squared x double dot plus x dot equals w dot. But this I will not mention more. So what is the hypolytic Laplacian good for? This operator LB is called the hypolytic Laplacian. So as I explained, the deformation preserves certain spectral invariants. On locally symmetric spaces, 
the deformation is essentially isospectral. We'll put this to work in the context of Zellberg's trace formula. And finally, contrary to intuition, certain questions insolvable with elliptic operators become much easier with hypoelliptic ones. So this is absolutely contrary to analytic intuition, but I will not explain too much about this. So now, the analogy with index theory. And we will pass to Zellberg's trace formula via index theory. So for the moment, this is a slightly different question. So I look at x, a compact random manifold again, and I call it square x, the Hodge Laplace. So I introduce g to be a diffeomorphism of, of x, and I call L of g the left shed's number. So the left, left shed's number is just, we look at the action of the diffeomorphism on the cohomology of x, and you take the trace or the alternate sum of traces in various degrees. And that's the so-called left shed number. When g is equal to 1, that's just the Euler characteristic. So say Hodge, you mean Hodge Yes, Yes. So what we will do in the first stage is replace the cohomology by the Durham complex. So in other words, we introduce a Durham complex whose cohomology is precisely H. And we introduce the, in this case, the Hodge Durham draw complex. Uh, dx plus dx star, whose square is just a Hodge Laplace. So there is a formula of Mackensinger which says that the left set number, left set number computed using the cohomology, can be instead computed using the whole, the whole Durham complex. So you have the cohomology on one hand, the Durham complex on the other hand, which is much bigger. And you still can compute L of g in terms not of traces, but super traces, these are alternate sum of traces, of an operator which is g exponential minus s d squared. That's the formula of Ekin-Singer. This is quite easy to prove. And so the way that you use this formula is by making s step to zero one way. Well, the way this formula is than g. Yes? Sorry? I'm just trying to understand if this makes sense. This makes sense. Yes, it acts on the Durham complex. Yeah. Okay, it's it just G acts on the Durham complex. The well, 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 on the space of smooth of smooth forms on the on the manifold. It's a trace class. The heat kernel is trace class. Okay. There's smooth yeah. kernel. Everything is, is smooth. Yes. Okay. So okay. So so by making S tend to zero, the point is that you use this formula. You use an. I mean, it's a more general context of index theory, but in this case you can use S tend to zero to obtain the so-called fixed point formula for L of G. So it's a general fact that for G generic you can express L of G in terms of fixed points, and one way of proving this formula is by making S tend to zero. So let's go back to the heat kernel of X now. So I give myself X to be a compact rebanded manifold, and delta X to be the Laplace. And I introduce G. I de deliberately use the same notation for the heat kernel. So that the heat kernel acting on smooth functions over X. Smooth real functions over X. And I'm going to ask four questions. The first question is, is the trace of the heat kernel a Neuler characteristic? OK, so originally we had the cohomology of the manifold. And we had diffeomorphism acting on this cohomology, and that was naturally the sort of generalized Euler characteristic. But in this case, we asked, is the trace of the heat kernel itself another characteristic? So the, what this means literally is that we're thinking, are the space of smooth functions on the manifold, is it the cohomology of something? Is it the cohomology of something? So if it is the cohomology of something, can I exactly re-express this trace of the heat kernel as being the super trace exactly when I pass from the cohomology to the drum complex can I create out of nothing a complex R such that I would re-express this trace as a super trace on a bigger complex okay which would be the analog of the drum complex and if there is such a formula by making B, the B parameter, tend to infinity, do we obtain 
Zellberg's trace formula. Before B was going to zero. Before B was going to zero, that is was going in some sense of the original heat gun. Yeah. Yes, and we want to make B tend to infinity so that we would localize now not on fixed points, but on closed to the Is Zellberg's trace formula a trace formula? A left shed form? And the answer will be yes. So let me just give the analogy again. I just wrote the left set number, L of G, the interpolating quantity, super trace of G exponential heat kernel, and the fixed point formula. L of G is a global invariant, the left set number. Fixed point formula is local, and you interpolate via the heat kernel. So the analogy is now the trace of the heat kernel here for B equals zero. We would tentatively interpolate by a family of super traces, and then you would get on the, the right-hand side Zellberg trace formula, which in some sense can be thought of to be local because it's evaluated via closure physics. So this interpolation will be done precisely using the hyperlytic Laplacian construction I gave before. So in other words, this construction of the hyperlytic Laplacian will be a way of solving the analogy I wanted to make. So let now, me now geometrize the situation. So I will explain the construction in a geometric situation where things can be put to work completely explicitly and will progressively more and more to move to more geometric considerations. So I give myself G to be a real reductive group. If you think of it like SL2R, K a maximal compact subgroup, and X equals G mod K to be the corresponding symmetric space. Then I consider the Lie algebra, G, G fractal, which is split, which just splits naturally under P plus K. And it's naturally equipped with, let's say, an analog of killing form, like which is positive on P and negative on K. So let me observe that this splitting G equal P plus K descends on the symmetric space when you quotient by K to a vector bundle E, which is flat, and which is a Dirac sum of Tx, plus another bundle which I will call M. Tx being model on P, and N being model on K. So, we will actually work on the group times the Lie algebra, and we will eventually quotient things by K. So we work on the group G as a sort of model of the symmetric space, and on the Lie algebra as a model of its tangent bundle. Okay? So before, I had given to you the example of a Riemannian manifold with a tangent fibers. Here, actually, we will work on G times the Lie algebra, G being a sort of model. But they over K, so I have to keep K. Over yes. So we will have eventually do the quotienting by K. Okay. But first of all, we will work on G and on the Lie algebra separately. G being a model of the space, and the Lie algebra being the model of a tangent fiber. Forgetting K, you cannot I cannot forget. Okay. So I, I mean, be sure that K will reappear with a vengeance. So the analysis will ultimately be done on G person K G, which is a total space X hat not of the tangent bundle, but of Tx plus n. There is this extra vector bundle which comes in. OK, so we will perform two separate constructions, one on the group G and the other one on the Lie algebra G fracture. So we work first of all on G, and later on on the Lie algebra. So on the group G, I just quote two names, Casimir and Costa. So what actually Casimir did was introduce or construct the Casimir operator, which is an analog of the standard Laplacian on the Lie group G. G is not a Riemannian manifold, it's pseudo-Riemannian. So it still carries uh, an analog of the Laplacian. It is not elliptic. It's two, okay, so, so, so it is not a good operator from that point of view. And I wrote here 
formally as minus the sum of EI star EI. You don't care about what this means. It's just generalized Laplace on the group G. And I also introduced the Clifford algebra. The Clifford algebra of the Lie algebra G equipped with the quadratic form minus B. The question of sign is irrelevant. If you don't know where the Clifford algebra is, you should know. Sorry? Yes. Yeah, I mean, the, the Clifford algebra with respect to the basic building of form B. Okay, fine, since I'm saying the case of the Yes, yes, okay. So, so, so that's a Laplacian for the form B. Sorry? Yes, yes, yes. So CG is just a Laplacian for the skilling form. Okay. Yes, okay. So, so, so we use the fact that this Clifford algebra use acts of the exterior algebra of this time. So I don't care about what the action is. You should only know this. So I call U of G uh, the enveloping algebra. OK, so if you don't know enveloping algebra, these are just the algebra of left invariant differential operators on the group. You have a Lie group, differential operators, left invariant. That's an algebra. And so what Coston did was to introduce a Dirac operator on the Lie group G, but which is not a classical one. It is not the one that you attain by just using the classical Riemannian or pseudo-Riemannian geometry. A slightly modified operator. OK, that's an operator of order 1. And essentially, what Coston showed is that OK, so that, that's a, OK. This operator, it's in the tensor product of the Clifford algebra time the enveloping algebra. I will say on which it acts. OK, just later on, I just say, OK, but just let's look first of all at the form formula. It says that this Casimir has a sort of up to a constant that it has a square root, which is a, co the, which is a coston Dirac operator. So in the same way as Dirac invented a, an operator on R3 or R4, we square just a Laplacian. Poston found another operator, which is not the classical Dirac, whose square is the Casimir. So this constant operator, it just exactly acts on smooth functions on G with values in the exterior algebra, while the Casimir just acts on smooth real functions. So it's as if, actually, Coston had found a square root that of an operator which acted on the wrong space. So in other words, you have a Laplacian, which is a scalar. Here the when squaring it, when you square it, it disappears completely on the right-hand side. That's exactly the point. There is no Clifford algebra on the right-hand side. That's exactly what we're going to put to use. Okay? That's exactly the point that we're going to put to use. So uh, this constant operator has been used essentially in representation theory. And we're going to use it now as an analytic tool. Okay, so that the first element, the Casimir has the natural square root, which is a matrix operator. The first question. Now, we have to move to the Lie algebra of the group. So the Lie algebra is not an Euclidean space, so we have to make a trick to make it Euclidean. Okay, so I don't want to insist on this. G is not an Euclidean vector space, but you just replace the Lie algebra by correcting the k part by i. There should not be a factor. It's just standard i. P plus i k. Then this becomes an Euclidean space. It's a triviality. And then it carries a harmonic oscillator. So we're going to treat exactly the harmonic oscillator as we dealt with the constant op with the Casimir operator before. I claim that the harmonic oscillator has a natural square root in the same way as a Casimir operator has a natural square root. So here is the harmonic oscillator. And actually, when you have a harmonic oscillator on a Clinton space, you have to introduce so-called Witten complex. You look at the drum operator, just twisted by the Gaussian function, and you get two new differentials, d bar and d bar star. And it turns out that essentially the corresponding Hodge Laplacian, it is not given by the harmonic oscillator, but it's just given by the harmonic oscillator plus the number operator plus the operator which counts a degree in the exterior algebra. 
So we have these two constructions, one on the group, Casimir Custod, which is a square root, one on the Lie algebra, harmonic oscillator, Wheaton complex, which gives you a square root of the harmonic oscillator in the proper sense. So again, the square root again, x squared, square root of the harmonic oscillator, where does that? So the harmonic oscillator originally acts on function. Yes. <laughs> this new operator, it acts on smooth sections of the exterior algebra. OK? That's the drum complex. Yeah, it's still the algebra of the algebra. It's kind of strange. I use the text for the different algebra. No, here it's always the exterior algebra. OK? You always have ultimately the exterior algebra as an action. You will not have spinners. I know you're dreaming probably to introduce spinners here. Yeah. We won't have spinners. OK? That's why the whole thing works in some sense. We got three of the spinners. OK, so you have these two constructions, one on the group, the other one on the algebra. And now we're going to put them together. We are on the group times the algebra. We're going to combine the two. OK? We combine the two. Forget about this Clifford algebra here. Don't care about this. I introduce a new operator, db, which acts on g cross the Lie algebra. I just do the crossing with coefficients, OK, in the complexified exterior algebra of the Lie algebra. Don't, this complexification is irrelevant. So how do I obtain the operator, db? I just combine, essentially, the constant operator acting on the group with the Witten operator acting on the Lie algebra. I just do the combination of these two things. And there is a term in red. The term in red is made for you. Because this term in red, I have to introduce it because I will eventually come to the construction by k. Okay. If I did not have this, it will be there. The whole point. So the hypolytic Laplace. <coughs> so what you do, again, you introduce this operator LB. That's a strange formula. That's one half of db squared minus the square of constant. So db is constant plus something. You square it and you subtract the square of constant. And you ultimately construction the construction by k. OK, so let me explain what happens when you caution everything by k, when you go back to Riemannian geometry. So the Lie algebra descends to Tx plus n. So I call x script, again, the total space of Tx plus n. So you have now our symmetric space with the fibers which are Tx plus n. And our new operator, it acts on smooth sections over x script of the exterior algebra of the fiber. T star x plus n star. Smooth sections on x script of the exterior algebra of the fiber. OK, so here's a formula for this operator. Don't look at, at the things except the ones in red. The first term in red is the harmonic oscillator in Tx plus n. The second term in red is the geodesic flow. And you have a bunch of other terms which are matrix terms that I don't care about, that you should not care about. I care about them. And they are algebraic. They are zero order. They are all algebra. They are zero order, except that there is a term, potential of degree four now. I mean, it's just quartic. Yes. It is no longer harmonic. OK. And we still have the fact that this operator LBX, in the proper sense, collapses to when b tends to 0, collapses to the Casimir on the base. OK, by essentially the same sort of arguments I gave before. Wait, 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 wait. It's everything now already in the quotient, right? Sorry? Everything takes place on the quotient now. You, you're no longer, OK. So we are on the total space x script, which total space of this vector bundle. We collapse everything on the manifold x. <coughs> but how is That's right, but the Casimir still acts on functions on the base. It's a Laplacian. When it acts on functions, it's just a Laplacian. OK? It acts like the Laplacian. If you had to a vector bundle, it would act like the Bok de Laplacian. OK. So let me now just consider the case of loop symmetric spaces. So we still do a quotient now by gamma. For the moment, we take the simplest quotient as possible. We take gamma to be a co-compact torsion free in the group G. And I call z to be the quotient of the symmetric space by gamma. So I get a locally symmetric space. And our whole constructions go down to the locally symmetric space, which is now compact. So 
Let me state a fundamental identity which fits into our program. So what does this identity say? On the left-hand side, you have the trace of the heat kernel on the compact manifold Z, the original trace, up to a constant that is essentially the heat kernel. And on the right-hand side, you have the super trace of this hypoleptic heat kernel. This trace is equal to the super trace of this. In other words, you have expressed a trace on the smooth functions as being an alternate sum of traces of a heat kernel of an operator acting on a much bigger space. If you understand deeply this equality, you see that it fits exactly in the framework I gave before of the analogy with left shift formulas. In other words, we have introduced these fibers to just resolve the space of smooth functions by a complex by the drum complex of the fibers. And then this formula should be viewed as a McKinsinger formula. Now, splitting the identity. I mean, when we are in a locally symmetric space. Well, you can hear you feel about the true resolution of the super equation. What was the shift you saw? They actually resolve, right? Yeah, I mean, so you have smooth functions? Yeah, but when you have soft flat the shift, you can resolve. Yes, so. No, 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 no. I will give you the resolution. You just look at the drum complex along the fibers. The drum complex along the fibers, it's a cyclic. So it has cohomology just in degree zero. And its cohomology is smooth function of the base. That's a resolution. OK, so we've combined everything this way. So splitting the identity. On one hand, this is exactly what we wanted. But on the other hand, this identity can be refined. Because we have introduced this group gamma on the compact, so we, to, get, to get something which is a compact space. But actually, it will turn out that when you have a locally symmetric space, you can express the traces as sum over the symmetric space itself. Go back to the symmetric space. Each of these two things can be expressed as sums. And it turns out that the identity can be refined to an identity term by term of the coefficients. So in other words, it will become now an identity of sort of Fourier coefficients. So on one hand, this is exactly what we wanted the identity before, but on the other hand, it splits as an identity of so-called orbital intervals. So I will now just explain geometrically, that's in the remaining geometric context, what we are actually doing from a geometric point of view. So, the elements of a discrete co-compact group, gamma, are semi simple group theoretic sense. And so, I give myself gamma to be any semi-simple element, and I call gamma bracket its conjugate C class. So, actually, I told you that the, by Zerberg's algebraic version of the trace formula, you can express the trace on a compact locally symmetric space as a sum of objects, which are so-called orbital integrals. I wrote them here, <laughs> integrals over the group gamma quotient by the centralized of gamma. <laughs> so this is a formula which I wrote here. The term orbital integrals comes because of this g minus 1 gamma g. This formula doesn't tell you anything, and I will show to you geometrically what is the orbital integral. And it is to this machine that eventually the machine of the hypolytic theory will be put to work. So let me introduce a displacement function. OK, so if you have a semi-simple isometry on a negatively curved space, or non-positively curved space, you can use a so-called displacement function, d of x and gamma x, which is a convex function on the symmetric space. And I call x of gamma to be the minimizing set for this convex displacement function. So in some sense, we're back to convexity. So actually, the critical point for this displacement function, x of gamma, it is actually the symmetric space for the centralizer z of gamma. OK, so in other words, if you work on the symmetric space x and you look and the minimizing set for the displacement function, what you get is another symmetric space, which is the same metric space for the centralized Z of gamma. So what is an orbital integral? 
So I just describe it by words. So you manifold x of gamma, the minimizing set, x of gamma, which is totally geodesic. You take a point x0 on x of gamma, take a normal geodesic, take a normal geodesic to x0. You take its image by gamma, the image by gamma of all of these. So gamma maps x0 into gamma x0, and it maps a normal to a normal. Now, the fact that we have negative curvature means that these two geodesics, one and its image, they cannot be parallel. The mutual distance grows at least linear. And actually, you also use the fact that the heat kernel of the manifold decays like a Gaussian. So how can these two facts be used? Because the orbital integral is simply the integral of the scalar heat kernel evaluated all the normals here together with the image by gamma. So in other words, you fix x0, irrelevant. Take its image gamma x0, take all the normals here, take the image by gamma, and integrate the heat kernel along these normals. That's the orbital integral. And you see immediately because of this equality, inequality. Sorry? The rate heat kernel mean trace. Well, I mean, you know, I put a trace here because I'm thinking of terms of vector bubble. If you just had the scalar heat kernel, you would not need the trace there. No, that's the rate trace. Well, but I mean, we are not, we are in a symmetric space, so we don't have to. No, because it's left, it's like left sets formula. So it's like evaluate on x gamma x. It's that why you have y gamma, okay? That's why that's left sets. Okay, that's gamma x. Yes, so, but it's not a trace. I mean, it's a sort of, it's not a trace. But anyway, so this is a geometric version of the orbital integral that's something like this. And the second fundamental identity is that actually we not only have the equality of the trace on the compact quotient, but also in the symmetric space. The orbital integral corresponding to the original Casimir is equal to the corresponding orbital integral for this hyperelliptic construction. So in other words, okay, so in other words, we have now much better result than we had originally before. And now we can make b tend to infinity. We can now make b tend to infinity, and when making b to infinity, we will ultimately obtain a geometric formula. So, I will not, uh, I, I will ex just briefly explain what the formula looks like. So I take an element gamma, which I wrote in general position, semi-symbol e to the a time k minus 1, with a in p, a in k, and k preserving a. And so I call z of gamma, the centralized of gamma, and z flat 2 of gamma to be its Lie algebra. So it splits in the p and k part. And so, I will now explain very short time. I still have maybe five minutes, three minutes. So, there is an explicit function j of gamma evaluated not on, on the k of gamma. k of gamma is the Lie algebra of the k part of the centralizer. So, evaluated on i time k of gamma, such that such that, okay, so this looks again complicated, but the original orbital integral for the heat kernel is obtained by integrating our i of k of gamma, pairing the function j gamma. Okay, I have a trace rho e, I never mentioned rho e before, so eventually I have to introduce a twist by the vector bundle, by representation of the group k. So if you don't like introducing this, you can just forget about this term. So this trace is obtaining by integrating on i k of gamma the product of two functions, j gamma and the traits of the representation. So this formula looks like the left sheds, a Tierbot left sheds formula. So let me just briefly explain what j gamma is. So j gamma, from the point of view of index theory of left sheds formulas, is just a quotient of the taught class of Tx divided by the taught class of m. Okay, in usual index theory, you have just taught class of tx. In this context of trace formula, you have the taught divided by the taught. So, 
and also your integral on 8 pi of gamma. You can divide torque by torque. No, you can divide torque by torque. You can make the quotient. Multiply torque by the inverse of your torque. You can invert it. Torque is, uh, you, you can just take one of the torque. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. OK, so this looks, this looks complicated. But I mean, that's, it. that's essentially this structure. Quotient on the p par divided by, co by, by, by k par. So this formula actually is the extension to arbitrary groups of formula originally obtained by Zellberg for, for the group S2. There was no general geometric formula in some sense that the first way that this formula was, uh, has been obtained. And as far as I know, that's the only way. And so the analogy is a tier bot, fixed point formula. Yes. Yes? And yes, uh, one difference between some fundamental difference is that there was a generic, everything was one dimensional, everything was numbered. And now they have a vector. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So the analogy is strict now. You look at the LG, which is integral of the U, A move G paired with the turn character. The formula before is exactly of this kind. You have J of gamma like the A roof, and the other one is like the turn character. So the analogy is strict. Okay. So Langevin had introduced in 1908 this equation mx double dot equal minus x dot plus w dot to reconcile Brunton motion with classical mechanics. I mean, there was a problem of incompatibility. You could have Brunton motion. You realize that it had infinite speed, so it had need to have zero mass. So that's why I introduced this equation with m, which slows down Brunton motion. So in the theory of the hypolytic Laplacian, m is b squared. So you can do the parameter b. It's square. It's just like a mass in Langevin theory. So here is Langevin contre du note in which this equation appeared. I told you that, in some sense, the dynamic counterpart to the theory of the hypolytic Laplacian is exactly this Langevin equation. I don't have the time to translate this to you. So here are a few references. And the conclusion is, welcome to the role of maths in classical math. And happy birthday. Thank you very much. Some questions. I'm sure it will be questions because it, it was not easy talking, especially for me. <laughs> <laughs> but may I ask, uh, does there a connection of this topic with Mons Kantarovich problem? Transport, optimal transport questions? Yeah. I think uh, they, they could be. I mean, I think that they are, but they are not being formalized in, in, in okay. that. But the relation with localization of final integrals, right? It's exactly what they're after in the final integral localization. They're right, but yes. they're more, even more in dimension. Yes. Yes, that's exactly this question. So this actually should be viewed. Yeah, I mean that's yeah, that's infinite dimensional localization, but one degree, one one infinite more. Okay, so we have passed from infinite to infinite infinite. Yeah, they infinite. Yeah. Any more questions? But it was a lot of questions, so let's stop now. And thanks, people, again. Thank you.